Start? Let's start. Yeah. Calm them down. Hello, everybody. So many people is great. So welcome to our talk, the future of character animation rigging in Blender. <laughs> That's it. <laughs> so as an introduction, um, this is brought to you by the animation and rigging module. So it's just not this us three doing the presentation, but it's really like a group project. So please stand up, everybody in the module, or raise your hand or something. Yeah. Look in the back here. Yeah. <laughs> there you go, there you go. So, <laughs> you guys may have heard of this little idea of Animation 2020, and uh, then stuff happened, and you all know about it. Um, but a while ago, Ton and I had a talk, and he was like, you know what, why, why don't you start a new project three years, uh, three years to, to give us a new animation system? Let's do that. Um, so we gathered a whole lot of information in the past weeks. Um, and it's like open for everybody documents. We, we put calls out and on Twitter and stuff. And it was amazing because people put in so much information in there and so many great ideas. And nobody butchered the documents. Like, the community is awesome. Um, yeah, I have that somewhere yeah, in the slides. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. It's, it's crazy. Um, the presentation is a little bit rough because we had a workshop last Monday through Wednesday and like really had to last minute all the slides in the presentation. And because we had to put things in the presentation, all of a sudden these ideas had to become concrete and drawn out, and like as in mocked up. Um, so it was, it was a bit hectic, but I think we managed something quite nice. So here we go. We had 37 pages of broad ideas, 58 pages of all kinds of specific issues that we, we went through and reorganized. Um, then we started brainstorming, and we had a shared whiteboard online. And at, like, at like the, this kind of font size, it was four and a half by five meters of stuff. <laughs> <laughs> and we think we managed to like, discuss that over the past weeks and during the workshop. And, and set up a pretty good basis for uh, a future directions. And that is pretty much what this uh, presentation is about. So the goal is to keep, like, to empower animators to keep animating for the next decade. And yeah, this is big. This is, this is really big. It's huge. We have, we have great ideas. And this is like a bit of a disclaimer. We have all kinds of ideas. It's not a promise that you will get this in Blender 3.4 or 3.5, 4.3. I don't know. Um, so before we start with like what did we do, um, we had started by defining the core principles of a new animation system. And I feel that this was really an important part of our work. So the principles are fast, intuitive, focused, iterative, direct, and Suzanne. And we'll go over each of those um, and, and describe and show what, how they impact the, the decisions and ideas. And then we, uh, we had a beautiful design by Guillermo. Uh, it was made on the last day of the workshop. Um, so fast is all about performance of Blender itself. It's about um, basically, well, the idea is that, that when Blender is super fast, you get to try different things. Because if you don't have to wait for the software, you can make different decisions. You can try out various things in, in instead of having to wait all the time, which in turn leads you to creative freedom. And that's the final goal. So performance of Blender, roughly, we're looking at two different speeds. You have the interaction speed when you're pulling on limbs and, and bones and posing your rig, that has to feel real time. 
from usability studies, apparently that's about 12 frames per second. Um, uh, so this, it's a nice goal. It's not in the numbers because it's a scary thing to, to promise, but still as a mental model, we'll look at that. So there shouldn't be any chugging. It shouldn't require a dumb down rig when you're interacting with it or have like cut up solid meshes where you can't really see all the intersections. Uh, it should be on the final default mesh. And then there's playback speed. So when you're doing a play blast, that should be real time. That should be at your project frame rates so that you can really see what you're doing. And to give an example of a challenge in there, currently Blender takes a deformed mesh and at every deformation recomputes all the normals and then sends the whole thing into the GPU module which sends, converts it to another representation which sends that to the GPU which does other stuff with it on every single change. So it's a, a challenge to see how not to do that. Another idea that we have is some asynchronous uh, evaluation so that the character or characters you're working on, they respond in real time, but maybe the background crowd is not that interesting, so they could be updated at a lower frame rate. And of course you have to have control over this because maybe how a foreground and the background character overlap is important to you and then you should have control. So one of the ideas that we have, oh, sorry, the rigor things. So we, I talked about Blender being fast, but you can always make a rig that is super, super slow, no matter how fast Blender is. And so it is sort of a, a dance between Blender developers and riggers to make sure that we come together and make something fast. Um, so this is an idea, just a mock-up of what could be uh, the rig explainer. What is connected to this particular bone I have selected? Well, it's the bone and it has some constraints that reference other objects and it has it connected to other bones. And maybe you want to see the opposite, this particular prop which constraints refer to that prop. And there could be five rigs that all point to that particular prop. This is something that is very difficult to figure out now in Blender without clicking on every single bone and checking every single constraint. Also, we could do things maybe like performance heat maps that maybe like the facial rig is, is getting slow. And so that shows up in red. Maybe some muscle deformation in the, in the shoulders are getting slow. Maybe some other deformations are sluggish and they turn up yellow. But to give just a view like this on your rig itself, I think it will be fantastic. Hey. <laughs> <laughs> and then also, just as, a, as an idea, like once we get Blender that fast, we can, it opens doors. We can do other stuff, like having some um, onion skinning, where the current frame is shown there, the net future frame, some future frame is shown there, and it's still editable. Yeah. Yeah. Yes, you guys like that idea? Yeah? yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe Jason, you want to talk about the intuitive? Sure. Um, Hi, everyone. Yeah, so uh, obviously a big part of what we're trying to do is make rigging more intuitive. At the moment, when you go to start using a rig, if you know about Rigify, you have to go and like enable it, and then you've got to create your, you know, you have to bring in the rig, and then you've got to build it, and then you've got to go select things. And so there's a lot of like inherent knowledge you have to have in order to build things up. You also, if you don't use Rigify, you have to know to create an armature. So we talked a lot about intuitiveness for rigging. We talked a lot about intuitiveness for animation. Um, and like it says here, Blender has very specific workflows. If you're coming from other software, it can be a little bit daunting to come in and be like, ah, I don't know. Um, so what we're really looking for with Intuitive is something that is familiar and self-consistent, which is the big thing. Coming from other software, you're gonna have different ideas, but what should happen is as you use Blender, it should be intuitive to sort of figure out and lead you along a path to figure out what to do, but then it should be really, really consistent. I think the G key is an example for all across Blender. Once you learn G means move, you use it everywhere. It's super, super intuitive and because it, it's consistent. So we want that same experience throughout all of rigging uh, and animation. Um, yeah, starting rigging, like I said. Uh, and then a big part of this as well is rigging nodes with a component library and fuzzy search. So imagine you are going to go rig a character and um, you want to start like building out your rig, imagine you've got this great component library of like a leg and an arm and a finger and a head and you just sort of go, 
I'm now rigging and I'm done. And your producer is like, oh my God, you're amazing. Here's all the money we would have spent over the last three months on you right now. And you just go, <laughs> sweet. Um, and the idea with fuzzy search is like, you know, we all have different languages uh, and how we talk about rigging. So for example, some people, let's say I want to rig something where a character is looking at an object. Some people would call that a look at constraint. Others would call it a name constraint. Others would call it a point to that thingy constraint, whatever. Um, it'd be nice if we had a fuzzy search for nodes or components where you could just say, you know, I'm going to type it in my language and go, I know what you said, here's what you mean. And you go, thanks, Blender. Awesome. So we want that sort of uh, intuitive sort of experience. And like Sebrin was saying, a rig explainer that explains to you how the rig is working. So at the moment, like you said, in order to figure out what's going on, you have to sort of click around and know where to find things. And you've got, you know, mechanical bones, and you've got deformed bones, and you've got control bones. And if you don't know about those, then it's like super confusing. So having a way to explain the rig and how it's evaluating and what you've built is super helpful. But also as a way of documenting for animators, because you're gonna bring on maybe 50 people to work with your rig, and it'd be great if they all didn't call you and say, how do the hands work and how does the face work? Imagine a way to be able to document the rig as you're creating it, so new people coming on either to support the rig and adjust it or to use it have the documentation right there. So rig explaining for both directions would be really cool. Um, here's an example with some rig components uh, mocked up by Sarah, who is over there. Ready. High fives back there. Um, yeah. So there's a couple of really cool things here uh, in the bottom. It's a node-based rigging system. We're going to be talking about nodes a lot because I don't know of anyone who doesn't want to rig with nodes. If you do, there's a door over there. Uh, no, so you've got node-based rigging, so it makes sense to see the flow as you're building the rig and using it. Um, we've got the presets over on the right. And then um, what's really cool is I love the idea of actually, instead of trying to drag it in, like drag a component into the node system and hook it up, drag it onto the rig itself. That's where the hand is, drag it there. And it goes, oh, this is the right arm, or this is the left arm. Cool, I'm gonna make a right arm rig. And then it hooks it in for you automatically. So that kind of stuff is very cool. Do you want to talk about temporal controls? Yes, I do. I hand it over. All Thank right. you very much. Yeah, yeah. Um, so temporary control, it would be great if you could add certain constraints and, and, and modify the rig just temporarily because maybe those constraints are just for that particular pose or that particular shot. And you don't want to have to go back to the riggers and ask them to put a constraint in and then have that constraint in there for the rest of the production. Um, so this is also a nice mock-up by uh, Nate and Nathan. There is Nate. The Nathan. And Nathan. And Nathan. <laughs> so let's say you have a, a tailly ball and you want to animate that. <laughs> and then you can select a bone and you can pin it. And now it's just pinned in world space. And then you can select another bone, you drag it up, and that pin bone just stays there. I think this is very much possible with just some IK stuff. Yeah. We want to have this kind of, of intuitiveness in the, in the controls. Another thing to look at is uh, selecting two bones. And there you have a bit of tail controller that you can just grab, drag, and slap on. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> and then you can actually grab a controller and drag it down and it, it does its thing. And once you're done with it, just you can discard that part of the control rig. And part of this, and I don't think that's... Oh, and I managed to mess up the underside, so this is not direct, this is in the intuitive. Um, part of this idea is that we might want to separate posing from interpolation. These kind of rigs, great for posing, and uh, maybe a, 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 for a different shot or a different movement, you want to pin other joints together and move them as a whole or, or do reparenting or whatnot. But once that pose is there, it doesn't really matter how it was, was made. And then you have controls for interpolation. Maybe you want to say to a bone, now you're interpolated positionally. And then, of course, that implies that that chain is IK'd instead of FK'd. Um, but it would be a property of a bone, whether it's rotationally or positionally interpolated. 
Um, and of course, some constraints like angle constraints and that kind of thing. Maybe they are permanent on the rig. Maybe they are only temporarily for that particular pose. Next uh, of the fivots is focused. Um, and this is all about activating flow state. You want to work, you want to keep working, you don't want to hunt around for the particular constraint panel. Oh no, it was not on the object, but on the bone, uh, that kind of thing. Another great example where Sarah, and also her idea, by the way, is to have constraints live in the 3D space. So instead of having to select the bone and then go to another panel and then scroll around, maybe that constraints lives within the two things it constrains together. And you can just point at it in 3D space and then and work with it. Or maybe we have also a constrained library that you can just drag a constraint, slap it on somewhere. <laughs> <laughs> Another example of focused is driving shape keys. And on the left, you see the whole laundry list of, of how to do now the, uh, the current way. And that includes like grabbing the wrong axis, trying things again, uh, accidentally leaving pose mode, having to select geometry again, getting coffee, coming back. Mm. <laughs> Whereas what we want is as simple as how you would explain it to a person. If the arm is like this, the bulge is like that. If the arm is like this, the bulge is like that. Done. Also means no distractions. So when you're working, blend, and, and this is basically already a general Blender principle, uh, while you're working, Blender shouldn't change the UI from underneath you and put you in a whole different configuration where you don't know how you got there or how to get back. Um, things shouldn't be super flashy or popping in and out of existence all the time. The next one is iterative. Basically, celebrating exploration, making it possible to, to try out different things. And I think Brad wants to say something about that. <laughs> I can, yeah. So I think, you know, the thing that I like about Blender is that it doesn't punish you for trying things usually, right? It's forgiving of exploration and rigging an animation is typically not. So exploring, you see people do incredible explorations in geometry nodes and the results are all over this conference. They're amazing. So I think the, um, the ability to change your mind without destroying all your work is important for rigging and animation. The model updates, someone does a new storyboard, you, you don't want to have to go back and rebuild everything to this point because someone had a new idea, and that happens for everyone in production. Someone sketches 15-second idea, and it's four months of work out the window, and you start over. So, um, yeah, everybody can change their mind, and you're not punished for it. You get to go, yes, I'm going to just slap on a new rig and explore this idea, <laughs> yes, and iterate. Part of this is, um, right now, for layered animation, you don't have a global layer. All of the controls, all the actions live under each object. So wouldn't it be nice if I'm trying to animate two characters passing a ball back and forth, if I could interact with that animation at a global scene level and then organize that in a way that makes sense. Because if I animate them in the scene by themselves handing a ball back and forth, each rig and armature are separate and when I, when I want to blend them together or maybe I move them to a playing basketball on a ship at sea, <laughs> That animation now, I have to manage all of these places. So having the ability to have a global animation layers system to be recording keyframes and managing that data is part of the redesign of where actions live. And it's an important step to making animation faster and less punishing. Um, it also goes into all kinds of other things you can do once you have them not tied to an object. Sharing scenes, um, having complex edits that are shared between files and retargeting and all the stuff that comes with it. And at that, I will pass it to Jason for some yeah. A-B testing. So this is something that happens uh, quite a lot in um, production where you're, you, know, you start working on your rig, everyone starts animating, you're doing your tests, and then some animator, um, I won't point at myself because I never do this, <laughs> but somebody always says, hey, wouldn't it be better if we had a rig that does this? And then as the character TD, you're like, that is a, such a good idea. <laughs> all right, there's 13 other animators who are animating already, and then we've got to show these tests to the director, and then we're going to have to make this change, and how do I push it through and tell people not to update or to update? And it becomes a big ordeal to manage it. Um, so this is a quick mock-up of like a leg selector that you could do in rigging nodes. This is actually possible now if you use the rigging nodes add-on. 
where you could go ahead and create two different types of leg rigs and then make a little switch so that you can have animators using the old leg rig or the new leg rig. And so we want to make the ability to update rigs without destroying your entire pipeline something that is built in and uh, very, very possible and easy to do. And I directly give it to oh. Thank, <laughs> Thank you. Think, unless I step right back up again. Sure. Yeah, 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 you may want to. Oh, I do, yeah. yeah. It's your thing. Hey, thanks Welcome for the back. introduction. That was amazing. <laughs> hey, how's everyone been doing? Great. Um, so direct. Uh, so yes, and this, this uh, fits a lot with like basically just trying to, it, it works a lot with focused. Um, you may notice a lot of these principles that we have are sort of a Venn diagram of importance um, because they are really all about helping you, as we said before, empowering you to uh, spend all of your time animating um, or as much as possible. So mesh-based mesh control selection. So the idea here is that you don't have to uh, generate these sort of curve controls that kind of represent the thing that you're trying to select. We want you to be working directly on the objects as you're animating them. So if I'm you know, working on the face, I should be able to pick the corner of the mouth and move it because that's the thing I want. It shouldn't be like, well, which of these curves is the thing that represents what I want? It's like just pick it and drag it. Um, so the idea is here as I am moving the mouse over to the hips, which is I want to grab, it's showing like pre-selection highlighting so that by the time I go and I pick it, I know that that was the thing that I wanted to pick. So it's like some sort of predictive like, hey, I'm getting over there, you're gonna pick this thing, so I know when I get, I get what I want, and I'm not like, oh, I picked the wrong thing, oh, I picked the wrong thing, oh, I picked all the way through there. Like, show me what I'm gonna pick and let me pick it directly on the mesh so that I can just keep working straight from there. Um, as well as that, once you have something selected, there are all sorts of other things that may be related to the thing that you have selected that you might wanna pick. For example, if, uh, and this is another mock-up by Sarah, so good job, Sarah, fantastic. <laughs> Um, we're all so proud of our mock-ups. Like, <laughs> <laughs> we did images. This is great. Um, so, <laughs> yeah. Uh, so imagine you like pick the tip of the finger. You should be able to grow your selection just like you can with geometry to pick the rest of the finger controls. So go all the way up the finger or across the entire hand or very quickly be able to say, um, yeah, pick all of the fingers or pick the fingers on the other hand or pick all of the IK controls on the arm or maybe the FK and the IK controls or maybe there's some new K kind of control that someone's going to come up with like a meta K. I don't know. Is there an MK? MK? Yeah, anyway, um, so being able to have the ability to quickly select the related controls to work with them the way that you want is uh, another thing that we want to do. And now for the editing okay? Yeah, so we've already seen um, the temporary editing and temporal editing is another thing. Um, play, like part of the direct idea is that all the visualizations that we uh, present in Blender, basically they should be editable. That's at least our, our idea. So that if you see a motion path, motion trail, you should just be able to edit it. And that includes the handles. So you should be able to just drag them up and, and go to the center one and maybe, I don't know, scroll wheel or, or some control to drag the, the keyframes inwards to retime your animation. And <laughs> and also, we've, we've already seen a bit of this. So you should be able to uh, have the key, the, the current frame in the middle, previous frame, Next frame, select one bone, select the other bone, drag them both up over time. Someone passed out. Get the <laughs> then we have posing in VR. And already uh, yesterday morning, that was, no, this morning, I think, was shown. Anyway, why not have a posed character? Point at it in VR, and body. <laughs> and then you can hold your hand in a certain pose, and ta-da, character has that pose. I think this is all current technology that should just work. <laughs> <laughs> and then finally, we have the Suzanne principle. And basically, this means be a good Blender citizen. We're not reinventing all of Blender. Uh, it has to fit within the, the, the Blender mindset, the Blender f philosophy. It has to have the consistent UI and UX throughout all of Blender. So we're not going to change things 
just for the animation module. Like maybe maybe there will be bigger changes that go across Blender, but then they really have to be done in collaboration with other modules. Um, also, Blender's backward compatibility uh, promise, I think, is really strong. You can still open a Blender 1.0 file, and everything that can get converted will be converted. And like, of course, it's not perfect, but there's a lot of effort in the versioning code and making sure that you can still load older stuff. So before we would kick out the current system, we would definitely ma make sure that if we kick it out, that would happen only after we made a compatibility layer. Same as the um, uh, proxy system was only removed after there was automatic conversion to library overrides. Also, the Blender community process is super important, and that will just stay there. I mean, animation and rigging module is busier than ever, and I think it's, it's super important to keep that going. And then finally, like, what, what does it mean? <laughs> So often people point at other software or other things in life and say, oh, yeah, you should do it like that, because that is so awesome. Yeah, but why? What's, what's the idea behind that thing that you like so much? Why does it bring you so much pleasure to use it? What, mm, what is it? And then, how does that translate to Blender? And because if we're just going to copy ideas from other systems, it's going to be a mess, it's going to be boring, it's going to be only what other people do, and then we're always running behind, and we want to shape the future. So, we've seen fast, intuitive, focused, iterative, direct, and Suzanne, aka FIFIDs, because one FIFID is never enough. <laughs> So before people ask questions, we wanted to present a list of givens. Like, these are things we're thinking about, we want to have, like, of course, rigging nodes, of course, animation layers, of course, we want to have easier multi-object uh, animation. Uh, we want to improve the core animation data handling. Uh, we want to have rig explainer, the profiler, animating in VR, super fast rig evaluation so that everything is running at super speed. We want mastering of time, we should be able to polish time. We should be able to sculpt animation data, even when it's like a huge bucket of mocap data. You should be able to work with that easily. Um, simpler things like bone pickers. <laughs> so the next steps, uh, the, the current development will just continue. So we're not abandoning all of Blender to make something new and shiny and come back in 10 years. Um, some things we can maybe start already while we're like bug fixing the current system and, and tweaking and polishing things. So maybe like a profiler we could maybe already make um, regardless of the evaluation engine for rigs uh, and then just plug it into the new system when we have that. Uh, maybe also things like caching of, of uh, meshes over time. Um, maybe we can also do that already in Blender without having a completely new system. So I will organize things, I will categorize all the ideas, I will go over all the information that we have, uh, again, um, and try to figure out how do we do things and how much work it is, um, and also what should come first. Like, what are the biggest questions that we have that block us from implementing all these ideas? Um, and then try to build a coherent vision with the entire module. So the timeline, this year, next year, explore possibilities, make some prototypes, try things out. Especially because we want to basically start with the biggest unknown. Uh, we have to try out things and see how they work and what doesn't work. And then, and then usable cool stuff. <laughs> no promises as to what that will be. But I want it to be usable. I want it to be cool. So. And you want it to be stuff. And I want it to be stuff. Yeah. Lots of stuff. <laughs> Definitely looking for developers. So if you have interest in working on this, uh, come to me, let me know. Uh, also, we have the animation module channel on Blender Chat. We have uh, on devtalk.blender.org, we always publish the meeting notes. They also have links to the previous meeting notes. And if you're an older one, to the next meeting notes. Uh, there is also the link to the Google Meet room that we use for the weekly module meetings because as of now, they're going to be every week instead of every other week. 
Um, we have uh, a calendar. I set that up where all the meetings are in. So you have one URL that you can slap onto Google Calendar or something. And then you'll get notifications about all the meetings that we're planning. Thank you very much. Yeah, yes. we have time. <laughs> How Thoughts, much time? Oh. Questions? You've got plenty of time. There. Skidding. Will we be finally doing away with the hassle of weight painting in the future? <laughs> Will we finally be going away from weight painting in the future? The well, at, at least the hassles. Yes, of course. <laughs> <laughs> AI for everything. <laughs> the answer is AI, yes. Yeah. <laughs> I think we had, we had talked about one of the things is uh, freedom from like to change things and not freak out, and that's one of the big problem. There's a couple problems with weight painting. Um, having to redo your work, sorry, <laughs> having to redo your work after you know your models change and everything is um, well joyful. Uh, probably not something we want you to have to deal with anymore as much as possible. So there's that's that's something we're going to look at. Obviously, we're going to look at ways for getting the weights uh, transferred faster. There are already some good tools for it, but we want to make that easier. Um, and then, yeah, AI, maybe there's some more intelligent ways to do weight painting. Yeah. Maybe some machine learning around skinning. Some companies are doing that, which is really impressive. So it's definitely something we're looking at to make better. Strong agenda, too, and like basically bringing in all the bits and pieces that are hidden everywhere and just yeah. them in a consistent workflow so that you can access these pieces easily as opposed to being like, oh, that's over here and then that's over here. So it's all your tool sets right there so you can kind of move them all. Weight painting in Blender right now is actually pretty amazing, but it's all over the place. And it half works and there's lots of work around and stuff like that. So making that more consistent and intuitive is a big, big push for me personally. Yes. Mm -hmm. More questions? Uh, I'm not coming from the character animation, but I, I just guessed because you like animated two things in time. So would like um, mastering time also incorporate like seeing the speed of animation? So mm -hmm. from other software it would be like known to see like the speed of something and also you could from this, like, get, like, the velocity of something happening. Yeah, so the question is, which is we want to visualize speed, basically. I think, yeah, we should. I mean, we have these motion trails, and right now they're white. So there's plenty of space there to make them <laughs> a different color. Colors we can choose. We can co choose colors. We can make them thicker or thinner, or maybe you want to... We, we actually talked about this during the workshop. Maybe you want to see acceleration there instead of velocity, and I think that shouldn't be too hard to do. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> we only have so much time for mock-ups, yeah. 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 Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. The mock-up was in progress. Yeah. If, uh, if you use, for example, motion paths also to, to edit, and these are basically curves, will I be able to edit them with geometry nodes? Oh. 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 Wait, so the qu I, I'm going to repeat the question for the microphone and the recording and the people at home. So the question was, uh, since motion paths are basically points in space, would we be able to edit them with um, geometry nodes? I think it's an interesting idea, for sure. Smith, can I comment on that actually? Uh, so there's gonna, one of the things we also talked about is being able to visualize things that aren't uh, directly the keyframe data. Mm. So for example, you could choose a separate point, right, that uh, is not where the active keyframes are, that may involve multiple things and be able to visualize that curve and also edit it, but that's not an actual piece of data, it's just representing an overall system. So for things that are directly uh, data in Blender, uh, maybe, that's a super cool idea, I can imagine that being really awesome, but also there may be uh, situations that are also useful for visualizations that you wouldn't necessarily be able to do that with because they're kind of transient generated data. Mm -hmm. Yes. <laughs> What, can, can you speak up louder? Oh yeah, yeah of yeah, course. Yeah, yeah. That should be in the givens. Yeah. Like yeah. collections for for like organizing your rig. Yeah, for sure. You want like names on those or something? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. That's going too far. <laughs> Oh yes, and we also have ideas on um, like really 
looking at organization of rigs. So that includes this plane outlier there, that includes um, selection sets being defined on the rig and maybe extendable per shot, uh, those kind of things. Can I see the discussions about making yeah. custom collections? Yeah. And then, you know, so that would be like part of your picking set, but then in terms of weight painting as well, right? Being able to make custom sets, you're not hunting around for the bones. You can right. Them. I'll just follow up. So right now, that's still conceptually just everything stuck in the armature as an object. And so we're, right now, you enter that to do a lot of the stuff, and including actions for animation layers, right? Everything is owned by the armature and lives in there. And it's, it's limiting to some degree. There's a lot of great from things about it as well. So there's a lot of discussions in the, you know, uh, four acres of <laughs> the, the discussion about how the current system is limiting and what is good and how to improve those things. So the, the paper cuts of like making that better before, you know, 10 years from now, yes, but it shouldn't be, we shouldn't even be st stuck in the thought of like, well, I want to make this part of the armature better. How do I make armatures better for all of Blender, right? Mechanical rigging, human deformation, realistic things, face rig, all that stuff. So the answer, yes, if it's a, if it's a current thing in there, we want it better, but don't get stuck thinking that that's the only way it could be, mm -hmm. which is what we also want to improve. Um, do you think it would be relevant to make bones instead of them being sub-objects of armature, uh, making them proper objects? So you would benefit from the already existing of <laughs> Yeah, somebody. So it's one of the names. So one of their already like wrote down an idea of just getting rid of armatures altogether, and at least to have uh, consistent controls over objects and bones, and to be able to to manipulate those in in a similar way without having to flip between different modes all the time. Oh yeah, to yeah. get rid of yes, to get rid of the constraint bone constraints versus object constraints, yeah, probably. I mean, add that as a slide. Quick, quick, yeah. get yeah. rid of constraints. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> So the, the question is, do Mater's improvements to Rigify uh, on Cloud Rig, can we push them back to Rigify? Uh, where's Tomato? <laughs> is, oh, he is in the studio. No, he's me pushing anything. them back to Rigify right now. Oh, <laughs> good, <laughs> good, good, <laughs> yes. Um, <laughs> no, we, we actually, a few minutes ago, discussed things about the like, future of Rigify, and I don't want to make it dis like move that discussion to now, but I think we should discuss moving Rigify under the umbrella of the module because it's such a, a core concept. Um, and for this, I feel the same. Like either we should improve it or we should replace it with something way better so that everybody forgets about it. Sorry, Nate. <laughs> 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 oh, actually, Nate. This actually makes me happy. Good. Uh, Nathan was actually uh, involved in the original first version of Rigify. <laughs> yeah, I, I don't know actually if uh, X is the this or I don't, but uh, I think so that uh, something that would be really useful would be a way to visualize the dependency graph <laughs> and the flow. Mm -hmm. yeah. Then you can spot the cycles or isolate the fact of the rig. Uh, uh, yes, we, we have to look at like where the overlaps yeah. are between Blender's general um, uh, depend, uh, dependency graph and uh, the, the rig explainer that we saw, the evaluation of rigs versus the entire scene, and probably is going to be one system, one evaluation engine. Um, currently, there is already an add-on that allows you to visualize the dependency graph, um, but you need GraphViz installed because it, uses, it, it generates a file and then it need, needs to call that and then, and then you can see it. Um, but it always will show the entire dependency graph of the entire scene. And that gets very big very quickly. 
Um, so that's why we were thinking of the rig explainer where you can just click on one bone and see that context or a couple of bones and see that context. And yes, visualizing dependency cycles is definitely a thing that should be in there. And I would love it if that, like again, with a direct principle, that where you wouldn't even have to go to the dependency, like the rig explainer, because it's shown on the rig. Like these bones, and then that connection, and that, that is painful, so. More questions? Yes. Yeah, I'm curious if uh, there is any discussion on uh, improvements that can be done to the dope sheet and the graph editor, because, I mean, they're pretty good the way they are, but I, uh, once posing is done, a lot of time is spent in them, yeah? Yeah. And, uh, mm -hmm. I imagine that like, there are some innovation that is possible there, like, I don't know, different tangent modes, different interpolation modes, modifiers, to or I don't know, just plug it back. I'm just wondering if you guys are thinking about that, discussing that, and what would that be? Uh, we've mostly discussed, yeah, I mean, short answer, yes. Um, so what kind of improvements to the graph editor and the dope sheets are we envisioning? That's basically the question. Um, so yes, we would love to have improvements. The thing that we've been looking at so far mostly was to avoid having to go into the graph editor and the dope sheet in the first place. <laughs> yeah. yeah I'll, <laughs> <laughs> I'll, I'll take this a little bit if you don't mind. So. <laughs> Right now, animation is very dependent on feedback, right? And your feedback for what a control, what a result is, is the graph editor. Your, your only view on timing is playing back and hoping it's fast enough or looking at small dots. And your other feedback for when something goes wrong or trying to control something is the graph editor. None of those are related to what's actually on screen in your manipulation. So a large part of this process, the direct model is just like going to the rig explainer should be, or going to the rig nodes or going deep into something is for troubleshooting for fine tuning. You shouldn't from the gate try to have to figure out all of these rig controls as spaghetti curves. So the more intuitive controls, the more control you get in the viewport in context with the pose, the feedback, the ghosting, you always know where you are in reference. You watch Glenn Keane animate, he draws something, he throws another drawing down, he draws it again. He's not thinking like, I wonder how I can convert this to a, a line over time and tweak a tangent handle and do an illustration project in Bezier curves. He's like, no, I'm just gonna erase that and redo it. So the, the faster it is, it means faster interaction and less relying on having to guess and do the conversion to curves over time. Mastering time includes improving the entire manipulation of time and not having to, because I've had arguments about people. <laughs> Why are you looking at me? <laughs> uh, for backup is why. Yeah, oh, yeah. <laughs> Good <sense. laughs> I've had discussions with people about using animation layers as an example. And the fear about animation layers is I don't have control over when I bake data or I bake animation, I lose all of the organization that I've been carefully creating in the time editor or in the, um, in the graph editor, right? I've got my keys organized, I know that I can move things and everything is updatable because I've kept it organized. To me, that does not, in my head, equal creativity and exploration. It means that you're afraid of change because you've got an organized system and you're, you can only change it because you're controlling it. And if someone else opens that file and wants to change something or comes back to their own file, which <laughs> we've all done, and you're like, I don't remember how I created this, but now I have to change it. And you can either throw it away and work starting over, which is kind of the current method. <laughs> I've spent weeks fine tuning curves and building graphs and now I want to, the director changes this. And you're like, okay, well, I guess I will delete this and start over. And the improving the graph editor is like improving the, um, the readout of your car engine. <laughs> like you should just be able to get in the car and drive real fast. And you shouldn't have to like first check the, all the engine light readouts and make sure that the car's gonna start. And right now the current graph editor time control keyframe system is, well, your, your check oil light is on, but really it means that like you're gonna crash. <laughs> you know, it's like everything is in this little separate world from what you're trying to do. And so direct fast is moving you away from this like separation of head and you know mind and body and just keep you in the viewport so yeah if you want graph editor go for it but 
It shouldn't be a requirement to have someone create. Yeah. So we're not getting rid of it. No. <laughs> it's, it's, an, it's an important diagnostic. Yeah. Interpolation is useful for other things besides character animation. Totally. And it's, it's important to be able to be comfortable with change. And that means not being afraid that you lose control because you suddenly have 100 keyframes instead of two. And that's yep. currently, I've watched people over and over again be afraid of change because it means that they have to start something over. And again, you watch any other artist and it's a destructive process. Like a sculptor is just like, oh, I, I took too much clay away, stick it on. I don't care. I'm just messing around with it. They aren't like, well, if I lose the shape, you watch someone sculpt, you watch someone uh, draw or paint, you know, like I made the analogy, watercolor, someone has to like, you pre-dry the paper. If you want to add more, you mix it. It's like this live thing, but an oil painter can paint something and come back a week later and still mess with it, right? Like it's the paint, the medium allows change over a long period of time. And the two systems both exist. There's beautiful watercolor paintings and beautiful oil paintings. So there are people making mechanical rigs and animation that absolutely need a graph editor interpolation. And those tools should be better. You should be able to filter, apply data stuff, just like geometry nodes, to animation. And you have that, that little grain of concept in modifiers, but wouldn't that be nice if it was expanded the same control you have over geometry? We had that over animation. And that's really where I would like to see it go. That sounds great, Brad. Basically, yes, both, for sure. <laughs> anyone. Anyone, anyone. Um, and because I think what we try to achieve is something that is much more on the conceptual level. And to try out different things, different ways of working, different visualizations. And then it doesn't really matter whether like, it's in Python or C++, except for the fast. There it is. <laughs> <laughs> but... Um, like, would a control work better if you drag it like this or you drag it like that? If, if that control is made in Python and it's a bit sluggish, uh, for prototyping, it's fantastic. <laughs> <laughs> and, yeah, and there's, there's all kinds of other things that don't really matter uh, whether it's in Python or C++. And even when it does matter, if you have a prototype working and working well and everybody says, yeah, I want this, then converting it into C++ is much easier because you know what you're aiming for. So, also yeah. the, the developer job is a paid. We're, it's not just volunteer. Yeah. We want it. Yeah. No, really. There's a job opening for animation development. <laughs> Shape keys to a cache. Yes. That's, yes. <laughs> like, so I to know, is it oh yes, that's yeah. something that Andy was also talking, uh, asking for. I think already in, in spring or maybe earlier, just the ability to load in cached, um, uh, cached meshes, and then sculpt on top of that. Because once you start lighting, you see that the hand shadow just falls wrong, and you want to move the hand a little bit. That, those kind of things. Yes. No, it's not under development. No. Sorry? Oh no, we have to. I, I want to. We have to redefine how uh, shape keys work, because right now they in, internally in Blender they're a bit of a mesh, a uh, bit of a mesh. Uh -huh. um, <laughs> there are pointers going everywhere. It's hard to work with these um, in terms of library overrides. Um, they are very tied to the mesh, but they are not like not every tool, unless it has very specific code. Uh, not every tool takes the shape keys into account, so it's it's hard to work with them. So I would love it if we could have a different way of working with shape keys. Maybe maybe even one that allows you to just use sculpting tools on the mesh, and then it would save the effect of that sculpt. Um, 
so that you can load in a mesh of a different topology and still your, your shape key would work. Like, I don't know how to do it yet, but I think that will be kind of nice. This is Daniel Machina's work with the shape keys and stuff, being able to sculpt. Is that something that could be a shape key? Yeah. 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 The key mesh add-on. Key mesh add-on. Yeah. Sounds yeah, good. Daniel Martinez is, has that uh, key mesh add-on, yeah. and that's something that could potentially be, this, I guess, goes back to the question about Python, like, you know, seeing what's out there and being able to use existing tools and linking them together with Python as a proof of concept. And if it's something that's proven useful, and then obviously the community is an upper about it, kind of, you know, proof of concept makes it a lot easier for a C++ developer to uh, execute. Last question, Howard. Is there anything different about your vision for motion graphics as compared to character animation? Is there anything different between character animation and motion graphics in our vision? Um, not really. I mean, we were looking at character animation just to make sure that like, we don't go off on everything because in the end, everything is animation, at least from our point of view, right? Um, so, uh, but I think that these things equally apply to, to motion graphics, uh, especially when, when we look at rigging nodes about more procedural ways of working. Um, this is also one of the reasons why we don't want to get rid of interpolation, for example is you could do character animation without interpolation, just animate every frame. But for motion graphics, more mechanical things, this is unmaintainable. So, yeah. So, we just got a sign that we have to stop. Thank you.